and not that we've been through, you know, weeks and months of sirens. Game us. <laughs> All right, I think we're live. We're ready to go. Um, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for being here tonight for this joint author conversation between Garth Greenwell and Paul Lasicki. We would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which the bookstore is located is the occupied, unceded, seized territory of the Peoria, Potawatomi, Miami, and Sioux people. My name is Carly Nussbaum, and I work as the Outreach and Sales Liaison for Women and Children First. We are one of the last remaining feminist bookstores in the United States, so a big thank you for supporting us. Um, as you may know, our physical bookstore is still temporarily closed, but you can still order a copy of the new releases discussed tonight and other titles from our website at womenandchildrenfirst.com. There's also a nifty buy the book box at the bottom of your screen. Um, events are a vital part of our store's mission, and if you're interested in learning more about our events each month, you can head to our website to sign up for our monthly newsletter. Um, coming up on Monday, you can join us for a virtual conversation with Michael Arsenault and Samantha Irby around Michael's new book, I Don't Want to Die For. Now, I have the privilege to introduce the authors who will be in conversation tonight. And just as a reminder, everyone is welcome to ask questions for the authors anytime using the ask a question box located at the bottom of the screen and pointing hopefully in the right direction. Um, all right, so Paul Lasicki is the author of five books, including Famous Builder and Lawn Boy. He has received fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation and the NEA, among other organizations. He teaches in the MFA program at Rutgers University, and tonight, Paul will be reading from and discussing his new memoir, Later, My Life at the Edge of the World, a stunning portrait of community, identity, and sexuality. Garth Greenwell is the author of What Belongs to You, which won the British Book Award for debut of the year, was longlisted for the National Book Award, and was a finalist for six other awards, including the Penn Faulkner Award and the LA Times Book Prize. A 2020 Guggenheim Fellow, he lives in Iowa City. So tonight, Garth will be reading from and discussing Cleanness, a collection of interwoven stories set in Sophia that delve into the complexities of romance and desire. Um, Later and Cleanness are both masterfully written works that are beautifully centered in their prospective locations as they speak to the larger explorations of identity, belonging, and intimacy. And now, as I hand it over, please welcome Garth Greenwell and Paul Lasicki. Thank you, Carly. Thanks so much for having us, and thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, this event was initially scheduled for March 18th at the store, and my plan that night was to take Garth out to celebrate his birthday dinner, because his birthday was the following day. and. Um, that's still on hold, that's still gonna happen. Um, and um, Women and Children First were so wonderful that they decided to reschedule this event um, for late June. And um, we were going to be back in the store, but here we are on Crowdcast and, and it's, it's lovely to see everyone. And um, so we're going to just read short sections from our books and then talk back and forth a bit and um, leave time for um, questions from you all. There's, as Carly said, there's the ask a question tab at the bottom of the screen. So we're counting on you to keep the energy going after a little while. So um, this section um, later is set um, in the early 1990s in Provincetown, Massachusetts. It's a memoir. It, Provincetown in that era was a haven for people with HIV and AIDS. And um, it's not only a personal story, but it's also the story of a town and how its inhabitants kept one another lifted and awake and alive during a time of extended emergency. So this little section is called Hollywood and it's set on the night of the release of the movie Philadelphia. So sometime, 
December 1993. Hollywood. Noah and I sit on the left side of the Wellfleet Cinemas, not so far from the front. Though showtime is almost 20 minutes away, the theater is packed. I've never seen every seat filled, especially in the dead of winter on the Outer Cape. We're here to see Philadelphia, the first big budget movie about AIDS. It has real stars, people whom every, everyday people like, Tom Hanks, Denzel Washington, Joanne Woodward, Antonio Banderas. Bruce Springsteen sings its theme song, Streets of Philadelphia. I'm skeptical about it as I'm skeptical about all things big, big songs, big novels, big ideas, big countries. All things big have an inborn arrogance to them. As well intended as they might be, they are finally about wealth, accumulating it. And I can smell the machinery that wants to draw people in, that wants them to keep coming back. Big statements aren't for people like us. They're for people who see movies just to talk about movies, such as why you'd see a football game. They're for people all too happy to feel pity for people over there, miles away from the epicenter, anyone, not them. Big statements hold a wet fingertip out to the wind. Big statements are inflected with a certain kind of self-congratulation, moral superiority. They'll say, we have cared for you all along when you know the truth was always more complicated. And how could Hollywood not get it all wrong? Turn the dying into saints, engraving in us the predictable, cathartic responses. On the other hand, it's a relief to be seen. Queer people, people with AIDS, survivors, HIV negative people, all of us. How long have we been erased? And if we haven't been erased, we've been represented as depraved, weak. Not that some of those representations aren't hilarious. Joel Cairo in the Maltese Falcon, Sebastian in Suddenly Last Summer enough. The theater goes dark. I'm watching characters move across the street, move across the street, but thinking more about Noah, my boyfriend, holding my hand, rotating the knuckle of my thumb with his own. Is there anything more satisfying than having your significant other holding your hand out in public at a movie? Straight people take this for granted, but queer people we can hardly wait for the lights to go down. And once the movie gets going, the real happiness begins. Noah's hand in mine. But the film is so determined not to offend, not to get things wrong, it's managed to situate itself in a weird in-between place. It, it, is, it isn't exactly bad, but I'm watching the way I would watch a documentary about dying dolphins. And I say that loving dolphins, but they're not me. Every time a potentially wrenching exchange happens on the screen, Noah squeezes my hand until it feels like the manual equivalent of Morse code. The movie isn't afraid to say, this is the one story of AIDS. No matter longtime companion, no matter brother to brother, no matter the man with night sweats, no matter the body and its dangers, no matter people in trouble, and I'm annoyed that it doesn't intuit that there are countless stories that will, that will never make it to the screen. Stories of black, Asian, Latino people, stories of women. Hollywood has the power to sear a narrative into the collective imagination. And though I resent that power, what about all those film executives still in the closet? I sit tight and obey. I won't start muttering complaints while I'm still in the theater. And then, a man stands up halfway through the film, abruptly. It is a bright scene as the whole theater is illuminated. He is crying like a baby, a baby boy, and it wouldn't be so wrenching if he weren't such a tough looking guy, leather vest, Levi's, salt and pepper mutton chops. I've often seen him around town, always in his leather bomber jacket and white t-shirt, always too butch to even look in my direction. He can't stand it. Once he represents something, it's real. And up until now, AIDS has only been a horrible dream. Now he knows it's an emergency and he stands up weeping. 
I want to protect him. I want him to stop breaking my heart. I want him to keep crying so as nothing up on the screen feels as powerful as this, with the absolute discomfort of seeing it, listening to it. He walks out breathless. I don't know whether he's crying for someone lost or for himself or both. Maybe he's crying because he thinks he'll have none of the people once closest to him, his parents, his sisters, when he dies, and he must suffer through this well-intended movie that insists every life is of purpose, every life shaped by logic. He has never known such good fortune. And if he should get sick, his friends, his friends, while well-meaning, might turn out to be flakes when they're most needed. They have bailed on him before and they'll bail on him again. And what should he expect when he's loved them for their spontaneity and quick passion and unreliability? Dependable people, as he knows, are boring people. And he knows what it's like to abandon others too. For a while, I don't see the man at the gym, at the AMP, or at the coffee house at the Muse. Not that I'm exactly keeping an eye out for him, that's just how it is when disappearance is as routine as breakfast. Thank you. Oh, that was so beautiful. I'm Thank you, Mark. For everyone who's applauding, but Thank you're the only you. one, the only one you can see, I guess. Um, I can't wait to talk to you about this book, which I love so much. Um, and uh, I told you I wanted to read first. And <laughs> you insisted on reading first, so now I have to follow that. Um, to sort of segue, maybe I'll just echo Paul in um, saying hello to everyone who's here and thanking you all for being here. Um, I like to say that the whole reason to go on book tour is to get to have dinner with Paul Lissicky, so I'm going to hold you to that birthday dinner that I'm owed. Um, Paul is one of my favorite writers, and it's such an honor to get to read with him. And sometimes I feel like I should pinch myself at this, um, the insane luck that has given me a life that lets me count him as one of my friends. Um, I'm going to read just a couple of pages, a very short section um, from Cleanness. It's from the first chapter of Cleanness, uh, which is called Mentor. Um, the narrator of cleanness is the same as the narrator of what belongs to you. And he's an American living and teaching high school in Sofia, Bulgaria. Um, much of the book, well, I would say sort of the central question of the book is intimacy and various kinds of intimacy. Um, so uh, sexual intimacy, but also um, friendship, also the weird intimacy of being a citizen in a place, um, and also the intimacy between teachers and students. Um, this, in this chapter, um, one of the narrator's students, a senior, um, asks to meet him outside of school and uses that as an occasion to come out to him. And in coming out to him, tells him this long story about um, falling in love with his best friend or realizing that he's in love with his best friend and um, confessing that love and um, being rejected by the friend and having the friendship end. Um, this is an experience that I think is a kind of queer beatitude. I think a lot of queer people have experienced this or something like it. Um, so I'm going to read the end the I should say the narrator as he listens sort of finds himself taken over by this story. Um, he finds himself kind of trapped by it. So I'm going to read just the end of this student whose name is G, his story, and then um, how this encounter ends when the narrator finds he has to, he's been listening for a long time and now he has to speak. So. Um, I don't know, G said, answering his own question. I wanted it to end, I guess. I didn't want to go back to being so miserable, or maybe it was something else. Maybe I did have some hope, not that he would feel what I felt, but that he would let me give it to him somehow, that he would receive it. If I could just kiss him, he said, 
his voice stripped now and small. If I could kiss him just once, that would be enough. I wouldn't want anything more. I looked at him then, wondering if he meant what he said, if he was really so new to desire that he could believe it. I don't think so, I said, speaking for the first time since he had started his story, my voice raw. I don't think that's how it works. It was a ridiculous thing to say. I knew it even as I spoke. Whatever, she said, still not looking up. It doesn't matter. He didn't give me a chance. I told him that I loved him, but he didn't understand me or he pretended not to understand. I had to explain it. And once I started speaking, I couldn't stop. After being silent for so long, I spoke too much. But it didn't matter what I said. I only made things worse by talking. He didn't welcome it at all, and he hadn't had any idea. I guess I thought he had known it somehow, that he was all I thought about, the only thing, the only thing I cared about. But he was surprised, really surprised, and he didn't welcome it. He turned away when I kept talking. He wasn't cruel to me. He was gentle. He was even kind, but he didn't pretend we could go on as we had. We would stop being friends, he said. He said he was sorry. He didn't want me to suffer, and it was the quickest way to end suffering in any way he couldn't be comfortable with me now. I was crying then, G said. I don't think he had ever seen me cry before. I couldn't stop. Why did you tell me, he said. I've lost something, too. You've taken something from me, too. And I had, I realized, I had ruined so much for him and for me. I was wrong to tell him, G said. I shouldn't have said anything along with everything else. Now I'm so sorry for what I said. But there's nothing I can do. I have to live with it like I have to live with everything else I feel. He paused and then, but what if I can't bear it? He said, looking up at me, finally catching my eye. And though at first I thought the question was rhetorical, I realized it was genuine. I needed to have something to say. I, rem I remembered the confidence I had had hours before in my own competence, the pleasure I had taken and the solace I could give. And I wished I could have some of it back, that it would ease the sense I had now of helplessness and loss, the loss of what I wasn't precisely sure, an idea of myself, I suppose which shouldn't have been so precious to me, but was. Other people have gone through this, I began, finding it difficult to speak. Other people have felt it. They bear it and they get through it. They aren't trapped in it forever. These feelings, I said lamely, all of them, they will get easier. They'll stop being the only thing you feel. They'll fade and make room for other feelings. And then in time, you'll look at them from far away, almost entirely without pain, as if they were felt by somebody else or felt in a dream. That's what it's like, I said, thinking I had struck on something. It's precisely like waking from a dream. And like a self in a dream, the self that feels this will be incomprehensible to you. And the intensity you feel now will be like a puzzle you can't solve, a puzzle it finally isn't worth your while to solve. I was speaking of myself, of course, of my own experience with love, with overwhelming love that had made me at times such a stranger to myself. But I could see this failing even as I spoke. I could see him recoiling from me, looking at me with an expression first of surprise and then of dismay and then of something like revulsion. I don't want to feel it less, he said. I don't want it to stop. I don't want it to seem like it wasn't real. It would all be for nothing if that happened, he said. I don't want it to be a dream. I want it to be real, all of it. And who else could I love, he asked, his voice softening. We grew up together in the same country, with the same language. We became adults together. Who could I meet wherever I go next who could know me like that? Who could love me as much as he could love me? Who could I love as much? What life could I want except for that life, he said, reminding me of the question I had asked so long before. He hadn't forgotten it. His whole recitation had been an answer. What other life than that could I bear? 
He raised his hand then, signaling for the waitress and signaling too that our talk was over, that he had exhausted all hope of my helpfulness. And I was both relieved and exasperated by this and exasperated too by what he had said. But this is a story you're telling yourself, I said, a story you've made up that will make you unhappy. There's nothing inevitable about it. It's a choice you've made. You can choose a different story. But he was already gone, though he was still with me at the table. He was taking out his wallet to pay the check, which I covered with my hand as the waitress laid it down. I've got it, I said, and he thanked me for the coffee and for the talk, as he said. He stood up and put on his coat while I was still counting out bills, and though he stood there willing to wait for me, he was clearly relieved when I let him go, saying I would wait for my change. I watched him as he left, walking hunched over just slightly, carrying away the despair he held on to so tightly, and I told myself he would grow out from under it that he would go to university and discover a new life in England or America, new freedoms and possibilities, a greater scope for love, and with it room in himself for other feelings. The pain he felt now would become a story he told to others, I thought, and of course he couldn't believe this. Of course it seemed impossible, I told myself. Of course I had, made him fa I had failed to make him see it. I walked into the street, breathing in the fresh air and setting off in what I hoped was the direction of Nevsky Cathedral from which I was sure I could find my way home. As I walked, I remembered other times I had felt impatience or exasperation with my students' private lives, with their outsized passions and griefs. And I felt this even as I knew that the perspective they lacked couldn't be willed, that it came only and inevitably with time. He would be all right. I thought again, comforting myself by thinking it, though I thought too that he wasn't entirely mistaken in what he had said, that there would be loss in loving another, that the perspective that limited his grief would also limit his love, which, having taken the measure of its bounds, he could never again imagine as boundless. And I had thought this before too, how much we lose in gaining this truer vision of ourselves, the vision I had urged upon my student, the vision it was my obligation to urge, though it carried us away from our dreams of ourselves, from the grandeur of novels and poems, which it was also my obligation to impart. How much smaller I had become, I said to myself, through an erosion necessary to survival perhaps and perhaps still to be regretted, I've worn myself down to a bearable size. And then I realized that I had wandered into a maze of narrow streets, the walls on either side too high to glimpse the gold dome of my landmark. And I began to walk more quickly, spurred by the unease that always claims me when I lose track of where I am. Thanks, Paul. <laughs> Oh, it's such a beautiful passage. I love that so much. So many like, crystalline lines. And I love the way that that dome just feels like emotional architecture. I think that's one of the things oh. I really love about the book is like your use of architecture in as emotion, as as totems for feeling. And there's always like that dialogue between the inner life and and the structure out there. So. In, in, in the arrangement of, of, of the squares and thinking about the parade on um, the protest um, march and one of those stories, I'm sorry, I forgot the title, but it's there's always an inter an interplay between consciousness and and physical space. Well, and that's I mean, that's actually, I think, a real meeting point of our two books that, you know, both of them are in some ways meditations on a place and meditations on the way that place allows or disallows certain kinds of um, growth, certain kinds of personhood, certain kinds of sociality. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit maybe to start us off about um, the origin of later and your relationship to Provincetown. 
Sure. I um, arrived in Provincetown um, during the fall of 1991 as a fellow at the Fine Arts Work Center. I had, I had been to Provincetown 10 years before with my family, and I knew that I loved it. It was also a town that was sort of part of our family's mythology. My mother had been there with her brother and her mother at some point in the 1950s, and they loved it. And, um, you know, it, it was, it had great mythical power, but, um, you know, it was a bit much for my mother to um, let me go to Provincetown in the early 90s when, she, you know, she knew it was, a pl it, it, was it, it was a place where people were dying. And, um, yeah, she had built up a lot of feeling around that. Um, understandably. But um, I started writing about Provincetown specifically in about 1998. And I wrote, the, this, this book was initially a novel and a novel that didn't, that didn't quite work. And I don't, I'm, you know, there could be a number of explanations for that. I, I think in part, I didn't have enough distance from um, the most tumultuous years of the epidemic. It had only been, you know, I think protease inhibitors had only been in wider use for a little bit over about two years. So um, I, I don't, the book that I had written was, probably a little too sweet and didn't didn't know how to it didn't have polarity like the sweetness in it my love for that place was not balanced enough with um you know the horror that had taken place there the horror and haunting that still imbued that place I did another, I, I did a little version of this book as part of my book, Famous Builder, which came out in 2002. And again, I, I don't think I had enough distance from, you know, the most heightened years of the epidemic. And I, you know, I just thought, well, one day I'll write about Provincetown and, you know, all of the polls will come together. And then, um, you know, my father um, had been quite ill in 2015, and um, he had a series of illnesses in which it felt it's he was he went in and out of hospice three times over the course of five months. Wow. You know, we would last rites would be said, and then two days later he'd be back at his condo. And there was something about the sequence of events after he died that just summoned up those early, those early years, the, the AIDS years to me, or the worst of the AIDS years. So, you know, my father's, I, I started writing this particular book just weeks after his death. And I didn't have, I couldn't really write so much about him, but I think his own final illness was a door into this period of, long ago, which didn't really feel like long ago. Those years are still so active and present in my imagination. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and active and present, I think, in America, you know, I mean, oh, yeah. the, you know and um, I mean, one of the things about Corona for all of us, I mean, I came of AIDS right before Pretty's inhibitors. So, you know, I was cruising the parks um, starting from about 91 or 92. Mm -hmm. um, and I think for any of us who came of age in that period, you know, this new pandemic is sort of reminding us how close, how sort of unfinished America's business with the early AIDS crisis, not to mention the ongoing AIDS crisis. Yeah, but even, exactly. You know, the early AIDS crisis, it's just there's so much that hasn't been dealt with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and when we think about the fact that there were like a million deaths, AIDS-related deaths um, within the last like two years ago. So mm -hmm. that's an ongoing story that you know the world has sort of put 
put in the back burner, as they say. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask about cleanness as being in conversation with what belongs to you. How do you see the two books um, talking back to each other? How do they talk back and forth? You know, how are they similar and different? Any, anywhere you want to go in that space? Yeah, so, you know, it's interesting trying to think of a way to formulate um, the relationship between the two books, because I don't think it's a kind of conventional relationship. Like, I don't think of the books as sequels. I don't think of one as a prequel to the other. I think of them as independent, autonomous books. I don't think you need to have read What Belongs to You to read Cleanness, but if you have read What Belongs to You, you will read Cleanness differently and vice versa. Um, so the books are independent but they intermingle to my mind. Um, the first pieces of cleanness, which are not the first chapters sequentially, but the first pieces I wrote, um, I wrote as I was working on What Belongs to You. You know, I would finish a big section of What Belongs to You and I would write one of these shorter pieces. And in some way, you know, one of the first things I understood about What Belongs to You very early on when I was working on it was that it needed to be a really streamlined container, that the book sort of in its form needed to be as sort of claustrophobically fixated as the narrator was on Mikko himself. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, really the book is almost a kind of pas de deux between these two men. Um, and there were just, I knew that there were huge amounts of the world that were being excluded. I mean, almost all the external world is, is excluded because, you know, for the most part, they're having sex in bathrooms or in, you know, the narrator's apartment. You know, there's, Sophia doesn't quite emerge in the same way as a character as I hope Sophia does in cleanness. Um, you know, the cleanness um, sort of is, I think of it as a bigger book, you know, not really in terms of number of pages, but in terms of mobility, being able to go different places, in terms of number of characters, in terms of number of concerns. Um, and so, you know, there's a way that, um, you know, there's a, like, so what belongs to you, like when I think of what belongs to you, you know, it still seems to me the book I wanted to write, you know, it seems to, like it's a book that I feel proud of. Um, I also think, you know, writing that book, I learned a lot about writing fiction. I had never written fiction before. And, you know, there are things in cleanness um, that I just couldn't have done when I was working on What Belongs to You. I mean, there's a kind of, I hope, a kind of larger canvas, both in terms of sort of, again, the kind of social space the novel or the book can can sort of enter or take in. And then also emotionally, you know, I hope that like the emotional, the affective register of the book um, is much broader than, than what, what it was in, in What Belongs to You, which again, need to be really tightly focused. Um, so I guess I would ask you maybe, so thinking about the, the passage that you read, I mean, one of the things that I love about this book, it's also one of the things that I love about The Narrow Door, your previous book, which is a masterpiece, and everyone should buy it and read it if they haven't already, um, is the way that the books sort of, in addition to telling a narrative, they also sort of are constantly creating space to think in a kind of expansive essayistic way about things like movies, about sort of cultural texts, you know, and to think beyond the bounds of, you know, the narrative of what's happening in this day in 1992 or three, um, to think about the significance of the film, the significance culturally, et cetera. And they're often very moving. And there's a way that, you know, something that's wonderful about the book is that it is in conversation with all of these texts. So you just read a passage about a film. I was struck, um, and it's interesting to me also that you say that the book in some ways significantly started as a novel, because I was really interested in the way that it seemed to me that the book was sort of constantly reaching to other genres for resources to think with. So, you know, reaching to poems, reaching to theory, which I thought was really interesting. You know, you, you talk about Jose Esteban Munoz, Cruising Utopia, you talk about Heather Love, you talk about Lauren Berlant, um, you know, you talk about these sort of seminal texts of, of sort of people who have thought about queerness itself as a form of sociality, spaces like 
Provincetown and the kinds of communities they allow. I'm just wondering if you could think a little bit about, about the book as itself forming a kind of community of other texts and how poetry and theory sort of helped you. I mean, how they were resources that helped you write the book. Yeah, I love that question so much. Um, I don't think anyone has noticed it because I really, I did not want this book to, um, I just didn't want it to be singular. I just didn't want it to be the thoughts of this particular I. I wanted it to, you know, to, to feel like a collection of group thoughts. And the, the danger in the early draft was that I would sort of undernourished my, the I, the speaker, because I didn't want to take up too much space. I was so insistent that it just feel collective. And then, you know, my editor very wisely suggested that, you know, you can do both. It's not an either or situation. So, I, yeah, I wanted to make sure there weren't only, you know, theorists, because I wanted in some way this book to be, you know, to be an enactment of a very particular queerness, the kind of queer, the, the kind of queer theory that developed in the early 90s um, in relationship to um, the AIDS crisis. So I wanted those voices there, but I also wanted the voices of some people in town. I really didn't want those outside voices just to be academic voices, but I wanted my friend Polly to be in there or one of the nurses in town. And that way I really wanted to like smash the hierarchy between all different levels of people. But I'm, I'm so glad you noticed that. I, I really want to write work that manages to draw from poetry, the essay, and the stuff of fiction. My you know, MFA is in fiction, but I've never been satisfied enough to stay in that lane. And I think, you know, whatever energy my work draws from needs like those three channels. And um, yeah, and it, it, doesn't, it doesn't stay still. I would hope that those three channels are kind of going back and forth um, yeah. from section to section. In the earliest draft of this book, it was far too straightforward in narrative. It was, I mean, not that there's anything wrong with that, but the orderliness of that did not feel authentic to the experience of fragmentation and expanding time and compressed time that um, I thought of in relation to my experience in Provincetown. So I had to mess it up. I had to keep messing it up and order it, order for it to feel, you know, to feel itself, to be its own animal. Oh, I love that. That's brilliant. Um, so earlier this year, I referred in a class to um, cleanness as a collection of stories. And one of my students very adamantly said, no, it's a novel. And he started looking it up on, on the phone. And I know you've talked to this before, but I, I think it's worth bringing up again. How do you see this book in terms of form? Does, that, does it matter to you? Does it have to be one or the other? Or did you make up your own form that best served this particular suite of stories? Or this particular suite? <laughs> you, can call them, you can call them stories. I'm fine with people calling it a story question or stories or a novel. Whatever people want to call it is fine. You know, in some way, I don't care about those labels. And in part, I think that might be because I came to fiction so late. Like, I came to fiction too late to sort of fetishize genre in the way that I do in poetry. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I don't fist fights about what is a sonnet. I mean, not, you know, gay fist fights, which means, I don't know, catty looks. But like, you know, about like, what is a sonnet? Is something a sonnet? Does it count? You know, I will fight people about that. But novel and short story, who cares? Like, I don't, you know, some people care a lot, but I'm not one of them. You know, also the, um, you know, my first education in the arts um, was in music as a singer. And, um, you know, my first sense of how pieces can be made into holes in art 
was um, song cycles, you know, singing Schubert, singing Schumann, singing Wolf, you know, singing these um, large works that were made out of smaller works that felt each song, you know, again, is it's kind of songs can stand on their own. They can be sort of independent, formally autonomous. You know, I think of them as sort of centers of intensity that are then arranged in such a way that they create charged, important relationships between songs that then cause a kind of larger structure to emerge. Mm -hmm. and, you know, that, um, I mean, you know, I know that it sounds sort of unforgivably pretentious to say, but I'm okay with that, actually. Like, I'm. Okay. I think there's a place for pretension. Yeah, I don't think it's. I don't think it's pretentious because I. Yeah, I, I know that same language. That's my. It feels like that's my original language too. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and like, so I mean, in in a in an ideal world, like it would be cleanness a song cycle because that really is how I think about it. And you know, and so these each chapter or story is a kind of node of intensity that is then placed into a kind of constellation by which I mean sort of charged relationship. But what constitutes the sort of lines of force that charge that relationship is not chronology, is not the usual cause and consequence of plot, but instead something closer to key change or texture or motif, you know? And there's a way that, you know, I wanted to create, so the center of the book, the center three chapters, tell the story that for me is the heart of the book, which is a story of transformative love, a kind of love the narrator has not experienced before with a man named R. And I wanted that story to have a beginning and a middle and an end. So I wanted those three chapters to be sequential. But I also knew, and that was the first thing I knew about the structure of the book. The second thing I knew about the structure of the book was that I wanted, by the time that the reader arrived at that middle section, I wanted to, the reader to know the whole arc of that relationship. And I wanted the reader to know that that relationship was over and that the narrator had been devastated by that relationship. And that now in this, in the second part of the book, the central part of the book, we were going to see the experience that led the narrator to some of the experiences we see in the first section. Mm -hmm. So I knew there was going to be this sort of like a more traditionally structured narrative in the center. And then um, chapters that are held in other kinds of relations. So, you know, I think of the first and the third sections as kind of mirrors of each other, that there, there are paired stories or chapters that speak to each other. Um, and that, yeah, so I mean, in that sense, neither novel nor story collection felt right for the book, you know? And there was talk with the publisher about calling it a novel because that, you know, means all sorts of things for the fate of a book in the world. But I was very relieved when they let me publish it without uh, a label. And so it's just a book of fiction. People can call it whatever they want. In my mind, it's a song cycle. Yeah. And <laughs> um, so I have so many other questions that I want to ask you, but- Oh I'm my God, how is I it know? so late? I know. I've just been listening to you and, and yeah, uh, yeah, we should, we should, we should answer these questions. Yeah. So let me just ask you one of them. This is from Sam. Hi, Sam. Hey, Sam. So, um, you know, for Paul, in your description of the movie, you mentioned the filmmaker's efforts to give every life shape or meaning and how that didn't ring true to you, if I heard correctly. That skepticism of false wholeness reminds me of how writers during the epidemic have seen AIDS as a threat to meaning and language itself. How have you approached writing a book related to AIDS without imposing something like wholeness on your subjects? Oh, I love, I love that question. It's really wow. beautiful. And it was really something that I struggled with in the book. And it, it hooks back to what I said before in terms of my sense in earlier drafts that logically the book was feeling too orderly. I mean, I was worried that it was moving toward a kind of convergence. I could feel patterns building. And while, you know, pattern building is so central to my previous book, The Narrow Door, and convergence is so central to that book, I felt like you're, you can't do that with this one. It's not going to serve. Um, an essentially violent, ongoing, shattering 
experience. So, um, yeah, structurally, I had to make sure to pull it apart. And the book moves to this point in time where the speaker, the speaker simply says, he, he states how many people have died. And it's like for the first time, he's able to take that in bodily into his psyche. And then we move, and there's like a brief, there's a bit of space, and then we leap forward to um, 2018. And you know, the, the danger in the 2018 section was like in the previous draft, I had like meetups, like not meetups, but chance, chance hellos, greetings with, with the former boyfriends in the book. And you know, they were kind of lovely, but in the same way, it felt, it felt too whole. I did not want it to end on a note of sweetness, at least in, in those terms. And I also wanted to write a book that essentially thought about or enacted the kind of psychological damage that AIDS has wrought upon our abilities to be intimate you know, not just with ourselves, but in relationships. And, you know, the book ends with um, the, spe the speakers unmarried, not partnered to anyone. And it's not, it's not grim, but it's, it's, I wanted to make space for a kind of expression and sexuality that wasn't one-to-one -one, as in boyfriend, partner, sexuality so i think all of that um all of your the question that wonderful question is spun into what the book is is up to on the design level mm. yeah well here let me follow that up with here's a question for both of us but why don't you answer it first where it says um this is from dominic hi Garth and Paul. Both of your books are a variety of stories and scenes quilted together. Do you feel like there's one story or scene that is the heart or crux of your book? Or is there one scene that resonates the most with you as you see your book now? That's a very good question. Would you care to go first? <laughs> <laughs> sure, I'll go first. Um, um, so, yeah, I mean, um, Probably I would answer that question differently on different days. Um, I can say the story that in some sense was the biggest surprise to me, and the story that does feel to me like the heart of the book is um, the very central story, which is called The Frog King. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's a story um, that a challenge I set myself, and I don't usually set myself challenges in this explicit way, um, but I did in this case, I wanted to write a happy story. Like I wanted to write a story about happiness and about kind of everyday happiness. So in this book, this book is often very hard on these two characters, the narrator and his lover. And I wanted to give them a kind of idyll you know, a kind of harbor. There's a, a different chapter called Harbor, but, which is not in Italy. But I wanted to give them a kind of shelter or a kind of harbor from this storm that they're caught up in, which is made up of lots of different things. It's made up of homophobia. It's made up of the financial crisis. It's made up of displacement. Um, and so, you know, uh, I'm also someone just as a writer, as a human. I mean, so my first education in art was in opera and it remains the case that I am a writer who is drawn to extremes. Um, you know, like I'm interested in kind of um, intensity of experience. I'm interested in arias, you know, but I wanted to write a chapter, a, a story, a scene about just very ordinary happiness. Um, in part, I think, the inspiration for that came from, um, you know, the fact that for the past few years I have been in a life I would never have imagined for myself where, you know, I am living a life that is affectively centered on a single person with whom I share a house, which is utterly mm -hmm. bizarre to me in Iowa City. Um, and, you know, living with Luis, like, has not 
radically changed my temperament. Like, you know, I'm basically someone who is equipped with a tragic sense of life, which is like not something I choose. It's just how I'm set. And it has certainly like, it's not as though being in, you know, a relationship like this has like made me a happy person, you know, <laughs> but I do feel like it has adjusted my emotional temperature dial just slightly. Like, you know, spending every day with someone I love, you know, like waking up next to someone, hugging someone I love every day, you know, like, I feel like it is just like, like two degrees warmer, two degrees sort of toward happiness, this slight shift in my emotional temperature. And to realize that that's a profound shift, that actually, you know, that difference of two degrees is important and feels to me like a space um, that is accommodating of profundity, that is accommodating of revelation, a space where literature and art can dwell. And so I wanted to write a story that's kind of about that space, you know, this space of domesticity and the surprise, so it's a happy story. The surprise to me was that it was utterly devastating to write. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, there was a way in which writing about happiness, about joy between these two people um, I felt a kind of abyss open up that felt really terrifying to allow myself to fall into. Um, in some ways, it was as scary, the, the sort of culmination of that scene is a long paragraph that lasts a couple of pages um, in which the narrator just sort of kisses every inch of R's body. And there was there's a way in which that scene was as scary to write as some of the more obviously scary or disturbing or abyssal scenes in the book. And that was just a huge surprise. I did not expect that, that that would be such a harrowing experience. But the tenderness is just right alongside the loss of it, right? Yeah, well, and there's a reason that, you know, tender is one of those double-edged swords, you know, a bruise mm -hmm. is tender. We feel tenderness for our beloved, you know, I mean, there's a, that warmth is right beside pain, you know? Yep. I think, you know, the profoundest thing I think anyone's ever written about writing emotion is Keats, the Ode to Melancholy, you know, where he says, and joy whose hand is ever at his lips bidding adieu. And I feel like, you know, there is a sense that, I mean, what it means for an emotion to be profound in art, I think, is that it contains its opposite, you know, which is one way that art can affect the kind of miraculous transformations it effects. Um, you know, but that was really a moment where I felt that, where I did sort of feel like this is an abyss and I don't know if I get to come out. Right, right. That's such a, so beautifully said. Well, but what about you? What about in your book? A representative scene? Well, I mean, I think emotionally it might be the first scene and, um, you know, the meditation on my mother and the goodbye to her, that feels like my mother haunts the book and the absence of her, the pain of leaving her behind haunts the book. But I think maybe on a more cerebral level, I'm cheating because I'm not saying there's one representative scene. I mean, I think it just occurred to me that what I just read was a meditation or an interrogation on representation, which was something you know, that was on my mind as I wrote every sentence of this book. I mean, it was always a, can I do this? Can I write this experience in a satisfying, respectful, true way? Can I, can I write this without sweetening it? Can I write in a, can I go to places that might offend the offend the reader? Can I write joy on the page in the midst of so much devastation? So I, I, I was thinking about failure and, and the limitations of what, you know, what we can do to make a mirror with, with every scene, with every, every passage, so. You do write joy. How did you manage to write joy? Well, I remember joy being very collective. It was not something that could be willed or engineered. It usually, it often, maybe always happened in public spaces with groups of people. It always involved bodies. 
it you know often involved dancing that and, you know dancing bodies together loud music permeating eardrums all of that um you know it was disruptive it, like the joy is not easy or slight the joy is always aware of the limitation of our our mortal bodies so um yeah um i mean that's one thing that i've been thinking a lot about in this time of pandemic like we're we don't have access to those moments of queer joy that happen you know that that, that happen in big groups where people dance and i don't mean you know i'm not talking about like circuit parties or anything like that i mean although I'm, i guess it's possible that joy can happen in in sure. those places but like you know, the joy that happens in a parade or in pride march like it's, it's always about bodies in a group and boundaries loosening between one person and the next and yeah so yeah i think all all of the joy is is about uh, the relief of being a part of the collective after having experienced oneself as estranged and alone and different and cast aside it's like oh wow there there is a space for me and it might be fleeting but right now there's a space for me among others hmm. it's so beautiful Paul. i should look i should ask um let's see Here's one, Garth, for you. How old were you when you left Kentucky and how often do you go back? How do you conceptualize, oops, it slipped the question. I'm sorry, how do you conceptualize your relationship and identity with the state and how does it affect you today? I ask, I ask as a curious fellow expat Kentuckian. Oh, hi, fellow expat Kentuckian. <laughs> so I left Kentucky when I was 16, um, and music was my ticket out. I mean, the thing that saved my life because I was very much a kid at really grave risk. I mean, when I when I think back, it's kind of astonishing, you know, um, having been a high school educator, like it's kind of astonishing just um, anyway, how evident it was that I was just in free fall. And, you know, I mean, I think, I felt very much that Louisville was a place that was killing me. I think that was true. Um, you know, and it was a choir teacher at my public high school in Louisville, Kentucky, um, who heard something in my voice and started giving me voice lessons after school and introduced me to opera. And my second year, my sophomore year, brought me an application to the Interlochen Arts Academy. And um, we filled it out together. I forged my parents' signature, <laughs> you know, like, I mean, it was, wild and then I got in and got scholarship and because of some arcane um, court battles that were going on with my parents, it became advantageous for my father to send me, to let me go. And, um, you know, I fled Kentucky and I basically never looked back. I mean, um, I had to go back sometime, you know, I had to spend the summer here and there in Kentucky, but always with one foot out of the state. And um, for about, I mean, more than a decade, before What Belongs to You came out, I did not go back at all. And um, when What Belongs to You came out, FSG wanted me to go to Kentucky on book tour. My father had just retired and moved out of the state down to Florida, which made me feel more comfortable about just being physically present in the state. And I went back and, you know, so publishing a book changed my life in all sorts of ways. Um, maybe among the most profound ways is that um, I went back to Kentucky and to my absolute shock, um, fell in love with it. Felt the kind of sort of chemical reaction with Louisville that I had felt with Sophia and realized that this place, you know, when I left, I thought that I knew everything I could possibly want to know about Louisville. And, um, Going back again in my mid, late, sorry, late 30s, um, realizing that actually I don't know anything about Lowell, that the place is kind of in. Oh. 
Come back, Garth. I wonder if he knows he's off. Hmm. I feel, oh. He's, oh. he's coming back. We missed you. Like, oh, no. <laughs> my, my computer decided. My computer was like, it's 8 o'clock. Like, I'm union. It's over. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. But, no, I was just saying, you know, that um, realizing that, in fact, this place was, um, in like, in, in endlessly mysterious to me and discovering um, in part because of conversations around what belongs to you, that the University of Louisville has one of the largest regional LGBT historical archives in the country. And I started going back to Louisville and spent about six weeks um, just spending eight hours a day in these archives and discovering this queer history that, I mean, of course, I mean, queer people are everywhere. And so queer history is everywhere. But you know, everything in my life was organized to keep me from having access to that history. And to discover that, and to, um, I mean, it's a way of sort of turning my childhood from something that I had to run from into something I could reclaim. And like one of the biggest shocks of my life is that my next book is about Kentucky. And that, you know, this sort of feeling I have about this place, I need a book to think about it. Wow. It's just a, a profound transformation in my life and one I feel hugely grateful for. And it's all because of publishing what belongs to you. Great, great. So, well, is it, is it eight? Could we? I, I, I think it, we've been on for an hour. So should we, should we I guess wrap it up? Paul, yeah. it's been such a joy. I know I could do this for like three hours. It's so great to see you. I love you and I love your work. And oh. it's so great to share this space and thank everyone for for sitting in. And I wish we could see you all. Yeah, same. same. You know, that's the only the one thing I don't like about Crowdcast is that we don't get to see the audience's faces. And um, but let's hope that we'll all be able to do that at another time in another space and uh, yeah so please um please support um women and children first please um please buy our books from them i mean they they are selling signed books which are super rare so and or please yeah. buy other books from them please love them and take care of them and support them they do really beautiful work in the world and they've taken care of us with this event and I really appreciate it. I know, I know Garth does too. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks so much everybody for being here with us. Paul, thank you so much for letting me have the joy of conversation with you and soon, soon, soon meet for that dinner and for a huge post Corona hug. Yes, you too. All right. Good night everyone. Take care. <laughs>